Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and computer engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering, and this is module 29 in my Computer Networks lecture series, where I talk about hacking and network security. Now, the topic of cybersecurity is huge, and it is more than just a networking issue. It involves fields like software engineering, operating system design. And so the purpose of this module is to give kind of a high level survey of cybersecurity in general, you know, definitely with, you know, sort of a network focus and to just kind of highlight the different areas that are, um, that make up cybersecurity and to give a hopefully fairly up-to-date snapshot regarding what cybersecurity challenges we're facing today. And this will be a, a high level introduction. It's really a starting place for a discussion in cybersecurity because this topic is big enough to warrant, you know, being the subject of several entire classes and obviously many research projects as well. So what's the challenge when it comes to cybersecurity? Well, as designers of the internet, we, our goal is to facilitate the free, efficient, open communication between your computer and the many billions of other devices on the internet, while also keeping certain pieces of your personal information private and secure. Now, the whole notion of privacy on the internet is subject to a lot of debate and um, many different points of view. So for example, Companies like Google, in exchange for some uh, personal information, will provide free services like email, mapping services, cloud storage. And some people, most people maybe even, are totally okay with that exchange. However, others are, are less comfortable and prefer to pay for those services in return for keeping some of their information private. The amount of information people are willing to post on social media varies greatly depending on, you know, who you are and what your personal perspective is. However, there are the certain pieces of information that, you know, the vast majority of people will agree need needs to remain um, protected. And these are things like health records and financial records. And so, um, or if we're thinking in terms of companies, you know, corporate secrets, private designs, intellectual property, um, and things like that. So regardless of where people come down on the public privacy, privacy debate, there will always be a need for the ability to keep at least some information private and secure on the internet. And this is a huge challenge because there are many different ways that um, a malicious actor can seek to access our computer systems and try to take control of our personal information. And the mechanism or the path by which somebody compromises a computer system is something that's known as a, a vector or a threat vector. And as we become more and more networked, the threat vectors just keep increasing. So things like a Bluetooth enabled thermostat could be a way to gain some level of access or control to, to your house. A Bluetooth connection to your car stereo may be a means of you know, siphoning off things like your contacts list to, to store within a, within a vehicle. There's been, um, you know, people will often when you rent a car, pair your phone with the, uh, the Bluetooth stereo in your car. And if you just sort of accept all of the defaults, all of your contacts list then end up getting loaded into a car that you will ultimately not, um, you know, be using for very long. Your Wi-Fi access point in your house can be um, a way to gain access to your personal computer and your personal network. Your social media accounts are, certainly can be compromised. Email attachments are another big one. And even the apps that we download on our mobile devices and our desktops can be a way of, 
you know, injecting malware into the um, into our computers. So there are a huge number of ways that um, malicious actors can seek to compromise our communication systems. And so it's, it's a big challenge, but you know, I would also argue this is one of the reasons why cybersecurity is one of the more interesting fields for computer scientists and engineers today, because the bigger the problem, the more interesting the solution space and the more interesting the work. So in this module, I'm going to be talking a lot about hacking and hackers. And so I think a good place to start is to define exactly what I mean by hacker. And, you know, hacking is a word that is very much part of the lexicon. Um, most people know what it is to be hacked or, um, you know, what a, what a hacker means. But the common understanding of the term hacker is not really the original intent of the word. So if we want to know exactly how the word term hacker is defined, it's actually defined, um, the definition for the term hacker is maintained by the Internet Engineering Task Force in uh, the request for comments document number 1392. And in that document, the following or that document has the following definition of a hacker. And it's a person who delights in having an intimate understanding of the internal workings of a system, computers and computer networks in particular. And this is the old school meaning of the term hacker. So hacker is just a curious person who delights in understanding how things work. And in this sense, you know, that's something that I personally very much um, relate to. I, I consider myself a hacker in this sense. You know, I'm a, I'm a curious person. I love figuring out how things work. I love understanding in particular how computers work and networks work. Um, you know, I've got all kinds of electronics and half taken apart computers and 3D printers in my basement. And I just love sort of, you know, getting involved and just playing around with, with, with tech. However, that's not how most people understand the word. And this is even addressed in the official definition. So the term is often misused in a pejorative context where cracker would be the correct term. And so if you look up the definition for cracker in the IETF document, cracker basically means how we have all come to now understand the term hacker as somebody who um, illegally or maliciously compromises the security of a system for um, their own personal gain. And so that is how I'm going to be using the term hacker throughout this document. If you've been hacked, it's a bad thing. It's not a good thing. But I, I just wanted to give a nod to this original definition because, you know, I still use the term hacker in the original sense. And I, I think it really kind of captures, I don't know, maybe the delight of working with computers and the internet and building little tech projects and stuff like that because I, I really still feel that that's the the joyful part of all of this um whereas you know it's it's sometimes eclipsed by you know now the the biz the big business aspects of the internet and high tech in general okay so where to begin well if you're interested in cybersecurity, the an excellent place to start to get up-to-date information is the Verizon Threat Research Advisory Center or VTRAC. And the VTRAC folks just do such a great job of getting up-to-date cybersecurity information out into the sort of general um, knowledge space. And so they have two uh, series of publications, the DBIR or the Data Breach Investigations Report series and the Data Breach Digest series. And in particular, the DB, DBIRs are excellent reading. I would argue probably required reading for anybody who is uh, serious about cybersecurity. They come out every year and they're just they do a great job of capturing the landscape of what's going on in cybersecurity. They summarize breaches and incidents based on data, not only that they gather, but a series of collaborating organizations gather for them as well. And related to that, they also maintain something called 
um, Veris, which is a vocabulary for event recording and incident sharing um, framework. And it's essentially a framework for tracking and reporting um, security breaches and incidents within your organization. And so both the VTrack publications, I write, I've got the links both to VTrack's publications as well as to Veris and I would really encourage you to check out both things. And in particular, the DBIR information, the 2019 report and the 2017 report is really where I get much of what I'm gonna be talking about in this video module. And a lot of the graphics that I'm gonna be using during our discussion comes from the, the DBIRs and you'll see, um, you know, I'll, I'll reference them appropriately as we, as we move through the slides. A lot of the terminology I'm going to be using also comes out of the DBIR. And the first term I'm going to introduce is the term threat actor. And this is the refers to the person or group behind a security event. So the, these are the, the hackers, if you like. And threat actor, so Referring to them as hackers is a little bit misleading because, you know, when we when we think about cybersecurity, we imagine these sort of shadowy, evil figures lurking, you know, in basements, typing away at computers, trying to compromise our security. But um, threat actors can also just be people who inadvertently, inadvertently cause a security event through well-meaning but um, misguided or erroneous action. So an incompetent system administrator who sets up a server with a bunch of exposed ports and um, doesn't update it so that it's got a bunch of you know security, um, known security holes in it would also be a threat actor. And this is an interesting plot from the 2019 DBIR that shows just how much, how widely and wildly the threat actors can change from, from one year to the next. And so the main groups we have here are organized crime, state affiliated actors, so the state sponsored espionage, system administrators, activists, and cashiers. The reason why cashiers show up is because point of sale um, security events is something that is also captured in the DBIR. So things like um, credit card skimmers installed in you know, gas pumps or you know, cashiers intentionally committing fraud or unintentionally leaving the system exposed um, is something that, uh, that the report tracks as well. And one of the things that's noteworthy about this plot is that we can see a lot of variation from one year to the next regarding the incidents reported or captured in this report. So for example, in 2015, we had almost 80% of security incidents attributed to organized crime and you know maybe 10% were state affiliated. Fast forward to 2019, and we see a lot more balance. The incidents related to state-sponsored actors are climbing. Organized crime is still there, but the proportion is down. And the proportion attributed to system administrators is really starting to grow. Now, it's tempting, you know, and the DBIR mentions it's tempting to think of these system administrator events as, you know, disgruntled system administrators abusing their privileges to, you know, hack the systems of their employers. While that does happen, uh, a lot of the events that are recorded in this are basically um, errors made by system administrators that result in security incidents. So again, not configuring a server properly, not patching, um, a security vulnerability in an appropriate amount of time, basically just sort of through incompetence and error, exposing um, an information asset to a potential breach. So just a, a little bit of quick terminology as we get a little bit deeper into our discussion. The term threat action uh, refers to the actions or tactics 
taken by uh, the threat actor. And so some examples of, um, so the, these actions are divided into seven broad categories in the DBIR, and then each category is divided into a number of different varieties. So for example, malware is one of the seven big categories of threat actions. And then within malware, we have a whole bunch of different varieties of malware, including things like ransomware, um, backdoor software, and stuff like that. A threat vector, as I said earlier, is basically a path taken by a threat action in order to gain access to your security system. So um, email attachments, for example, are a great example of a threat vector. That's a very common way for malware to gain access to a computer system. Um, we then talk about incidents and breaches. And an incident is defined as a security event that compromises the integrity, confidentiality, or availability of an information asset, but it doesn't necessarily result in a disclosure or a, an actual leak of information. So for example, a denial of service attack where a server is flooded by a bunch of packets to, um, or where a server is flooded by so many packets that nobody can access it, would be considered an incident because that compromises the access to the information on that server, but no breach has occurred here. Nobody has stolen information from that server. They basically shut the server down. Um, incidents can also include potential exposure. So for example, a uh, system administrator misconfiguring a um, server so that it has some vulnerabilities, but not necessarily being able to confirm that those vulnerabilities resulted in an actual theft of information. This is in contrast with a breach where a confirmed disclosure of information has actually occurred. Um, it's been confirmed that somebody has taken information from a computer system and, um, you know, for example, it could be the theft of credit card information or corporate secret secrets. So what I want to do now is go through some of those big categories of threat actions. So I mentioned the DBIR has seven categories for threat actions, and I want to just talk about a few of them. The first category I want to talk about is hacking. Now, again, I think we need to sort of refine our definition of hacking here a little bit. General, the general public refers to hacking as sort of any compromise or any sort of cybersecurity incident. However, the DBIR and the cybersecurity community in general tends to define hacking as an individual or group actively working to compromise a security system. So you've got somebody on a keyboard doing something somewhere to compromise your security system. And this is in contrast to something like malware or a computer worm that just kind of passively self-replicates um, across the internet from one computer to the next, um, eventually stealing things that will be given to a human, but there's nobody who's actually in real time taking action to compromise the system. So hacking, um, on, this, uh, on this slide again, these plots are from the 2019 DBIR. I've got the different varieties of hacking and also the uh, threat vectors that are, were used most commonly in 2019 for, for hacking. And there's some really interesting things that we can note. First of all, we tend to think of hackers as sort of, again, shadowy figures that have some sort of secret knowledge about vulnerabilities in a computer system that they exploit. And that certainly happens. So, I mean, down here we can see that exploiting vulnerabilities, I didn't, circle that very well, that exploiting vulnerabilities happens, you know, maybe 18% of, uh, of cases. But the most common way that people hack computer systems is through the use of stolen credentials. So basically stolen usernames and passwords, bad passwords. And so this is the first of many examples of how we're going to see the human, the element of human error brought into cybersecurity. So when you choose a password 1234 or your birth date or the name of your dog, 
um, credentials that are easy to guess or easy to steal are the most common way for people to log into a computer system. So hackers aren't exploiting any vulnerability at all. They're literally you know, pulling up the, the banking website and typing in your username and password. Now, where did they get that username and password? That sort of is something that we'll talk about a, a little bit more. But it really highlights the need for things like multi-factor authentication and you know, using reasonably strong passwords. The second way, most common way that people hack systems is the use of a backdoor program or a C2 um, machine. And C2 stands for command and control. So basically malware being installed on your computer somehow, you know, perhaps through an email attachment that then opens a backdoor to your system that a hacker can log into and then control your computer as if you know they were literally sitting at your at your terminal. And then you know we have other things that are less commonly used. Brute force is basically trying to guess all possible passwords. Buffer overflow is a, a form of vulnerability exploit. Um, and then we have some other you know smaller um, less common mechanisms. The threat vectors are, or, or how the hacking actually um, is performed, is also interesting to take a look at. So web applications are the most common, and this corresponds with the use of stolen credentials. So if I have your username and password, I can just log in through um, some sort of web application, remote banking application, something like that, and steal all your stuff, basically. The second most common threat vector, backdoor or C2, corresponds to the um, second most common um, threat action variety. And then we have a bunch of other ways that are you know, exists, they happen, but you know, they're much less common. So things like desktop sharing programs, VPNs, um, command shells, and actually way down here, there's actual physical access to the computer. So somebody, a hacker actually somehow gains physical access to a machine and then performs the hacking on the actual device. So now, even though the previous slide showed that exploiting vulnerabilities is a relatively uncommon way for, for hackers to compromise a system, you know, stolen credentials are, are is much more common, um, vulnerabilities are still also important to um, understand and to take a look at, particularly uh, for, you know, this lecture series, because probably most of the people listening to this video will be uh, engineers, computer scientists, people who are currently or may eventually be in a position to develop networked software and network designs. And so being aware of vulnerabilities is really important because quite often vulnerabilities occur due to errors that we make as designers. And a very dramatic vulnerability that was revealed a couple of years ago was the heart bleed bug. And the reason why it was so dramatic is because it was a vulnerability found in the open SSL um, open source uh, software that is responsible for secure shell access, SSH access, and a lot of other um, a lot of other services that are built on top of that stack. And the reason why it was so dramatic is because, you know, open source software is seen by many as being more secure than proprietary software because the source code is available for everybody to look at. And so in theory, there should be lots of people with access to the source code who are able to inspect it and spot potential vulnerabilities. So this was um, kind of a, a shocking event, a shocking vulnerability that um, really sort of shook the, you know, the, um, the computer community, the networking community. And so just to, to provide a few details, so this bug, it's called the heart bleed bug because um, it manipulates what are known as heartbeat packets that are used as a, a keep alive mechanism for an open SSL connection. So these are packets that are sent 
periodically and automatically uh, between the client and the server just to let the server know that the client is still there and still interested in keeping the um, the connection alive. And it, it's a very simple mechanism, basically. So the client will send some um, random data to the server and just ask the server to send that data right back. And the um, in addition to sending the data, the client also specifies the size of the data. So for example, um, if a packet sent by the client um, consists of 16 kilobytes of random data payload. Then there's a 16-bit payload size field that should also be set to 16 kilobytes. So you just say, hey, server, here's 16 kilobytes of data. Um, please echo that right back to me. Uh, and the server just takes it and sends it back. But what happens if the size field was set to something larger than 16 kilobytes? And so I can try to explain this, but a way better person to explain this is Randall Monroe. He maintains the XKCD website and he's the author of many excellent books, including books like The Thing Explainer. And um, he does a great job in this cartoon of explaining how the heart bleed bug works. And so, we have a person who represents really in this case the client and this cartoon shows the client sending the heartbeat packets to the server and so in the first frame the um, client says server are you still there if so reply potato and then we specify the size of our heartbeat packet, which is six letters. And it's hard to tell here, hopefully the resolution is good enough in the video, but what we're showing in this thought bubble is basically the memory of the server. And so highlighted is user Meg wants these six letters potato. And so the server then addresses potato and that is what the server sends back to the client. However, um, you might not be able to see it, but in the server's memory, there's all kinds of stuff, right? We've got, um, you know, user Ada wants pages about IRL games. And then right after that, we have a message that says, unlocking secure records with master key 51309, blah, blah, blah. And then before, you know, up here, we've got secure connection using key whatever. So the point is, in the server's memory, there's not only the word potato, but also all of the secure encryption keys that um, the server needs to keep private. Going to the next frame of the cartoon, um, Meg sends, the client, Meg, sends another um, heartbeat packet. Meg says, server, if you are still there, if so, reply bird, four letters. And here in the memory, we can say user Meg wants these four letters, bird. And so the server addresses the word bird, four letters, and then sends the keep alive packet or the heartbeat packet back to the client. At this point, we can see the client starting to think about this a little bit. And the next time the client sends a heartbeat packet, it says, server, are you still there? If so, reply hat, 500 letters. User Meg wants these 500 letters hat. And so the server starts by addressing H, but rather than going three characters, the server instead goes 500 characters and sends back not just hat, but all this other stuff that was in its memory as well. And including things like the private encryption keys that the server needed to keep, um, keep confidential in order for the, the encryption to remain secure. And so the, the fundamental problem here was the server just blindly assuming that the client would always tell it the 
correct number of characters to transmit back. However, the client can obviously easily be modified so that um, it requests basically a, a massive dump of what happens to be in the server's memory. And this is the exact code where the heart bleed um, memory compromise occurs. And so this is something that's known as a, a data leakage bug. And here we have it. So the, we have a, a buffer variable that gets um, assigned uh, you know, one byte plus, you know, one plus two bytes plus the payload size, which is what the client uh, specifies and can, you know, specify incorrectly and make it and make it too big, as we saw in the previous slide, plus a certain amount of padding. So then we um, just set uh, the BP pointer to point to this buffer. And then we set its response type and we then copy in a an amount of data equal to the the payload field and this is where the the exact line of code where the data leakage occurs and so you can imagine how this could be fixed we could specify a maximum size for the payload we could ensure that there's a a region of memory within the server that is um, reserved for this, you know, storing the heartbeat data only. And so it only copies up to that reserved amount of memory. And, you know, there's no way to sort of overflow the bounds of that and read things that are, are not um, intended to be sent. And, you know, this is an example, I think, like a great example of just kind of assuming that the client is going to do the right thing not thinking about the different ways that this mechanism could be potentially exploited. And I think particularly if you're, you know, contemplating a career in, again, sort of network software development, protocol development, or really any kind of software writing, you know, it, it's a good example of how, you know, you need to think not only about how the system can work correctly, but how it might work incorrectly and potentially be exploited by um, malicious actors. So moving on to the next major category of threat action, uh, I'd like to talk just uh, briefly about malware. Now, malware is short for malicious software, and it's more commonly known as a virus. You know, that, that seems to be the most common term for it. Although viruses are a certain type of malware, most malware now, I think, would be more correctly called worms. Um, a worm is something that replicates itself and spreads itself across the internet, which is probably the most common form of malware uh, these days. And malware, in contrast to hacking, malware is a passive piece of software that basically just runs by itself. There's not somebody actively controlling it in real time. And it just infects a computer then it replicates a copy of itself and tries to infect another computer and then spreads across um, a network most commonly, but also uh, malware can spread on things like USB, you know, USB keys and thumb drives and, and stuff like that. And it's interesting to take a look at the varieties of malware for both incidents and breaches. So remember, an incident is a potential compromise of security or um, interfering with the access to information, but not necessarily a confirmed theft of information where a breach is a confirmed loss of, of information. And so a really common security incident is a denial of service attack where a bunch of different computers that have been infected by malware are directed to flood a particular server with a bunch of garbage packets and overwhelm that server with traffic and basically make it unavailable for others to use. And so there's high profile denial of service attacks that pop up in the media. You know, you'll hear a report that hackers have quote unquote taken down the Pentagon's computer service or um, the servers for a particular bank, perhaps. And in a sense, they haven't really taken the server down, but they have flooded those servers with so much 
um, garbage traffic that legitimate users can't really access them. And this is most commonly done through uh, command and control servers, again, that have control of a bunch of different computers across the internet. So denial of service is not really possible. You can't be one disgruntled, angry person in your basement with one computer and perform a denial of service attack on a, on a major organization. One computer just can't generate that much traffic. You have to have many computers working together in concert. And so that's why um, C2 is the most um, common variety of malware when it comes to incidents. The next most common variety of malware is ransomware. Now, the reason why ransom, so ransomware is a form of malware that will take over your computer system and encrypt your hard drive. And there was a very high profile uh, ransomware incident at the University of Calgary a number of years ago where um, malware infected the university, many computers on the University of Calgary uh, campus network. And essentially the malware encrypted all the hard drives of all the infected computers. And then the um, people operating the malware, excuse me, asked for a ransom to be paid in order to unencrypt the drive. And so these people didn't necessarily steal the information, but they prevented the legitimate users of the information from accessing it. And um, that's, you know, becoming more and more common. And this is just the reported incidents, many ransomware um, incidents go unreported, particularly if a small business is a subject to it. If we look at the malware incidents that actually result in a loss of information, backdoor programs become the most common um, variation of malware. So this is a, a malware, uh, a version of malware that provides uh, remote access to your computer to a hacker that then uses that access to steal some information off of your computer. Um, command and control also shows up as the second most common. There are programs that fall into the spyware keylogger category that essentially record everything that you type onto your keyboard, including obviously usernames and passwords. And that is how username uh, credentials get, get stolen, which are then used by, as we've seen on the previous slide, used by hackers. And then we have a number of other um, you know, categories that are a little bit less common. If we go to um, talking now about the threat vectors for malware, without a doubt, email is the most common threat vector for malware. So this is, you know, um, an email that comes in, you know, pretending to be from your bank or from your boss or um, from the government saying, oh, you know, we need you to you know, click on this link or open this, you know, spreadsheet and or presentation and let us know what you think about it. And then as soon as you click on it, malware is uh, installed on your computer. And so again, another example of how really much of the cybersecurity um, challenges or many of the cybersecurity challenges that we experience are due to human error. So if people were able to, you know, be a little bit more careful about the emails and clicking on attachments, then, you know, a lot of cybersecurity breaches would, um, would be thwarted, I guess. Uh, but that being said, if you are the system administrator or the security head of security for a large organization, you pretty, you know, it, educating your employees about not clicking on attachments and how to spot potentially fraudulent emails is definitely important, but you know, somebody is most likely always going to click. And so you have to also be um, awake to that reality as well. Just um, a term, uh, to explain the, the second term. So the direct installation of malware doesn't necessarily refer to a person directly installing malware on, um, 
on a computer, it can refer to one type of malware once it compromises a computer system, downloading and installing other types of malware. So for example, um, a piece of malware that might gain administrator access to your computer could then download a keylogger, for example, and that would count as a, a direct install event. Um, also, it would be counted in downloaded by malware. So, so some of these categories are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So the social variety of threat action basically involves tricking a human into somehow compromising an information asset. And by far, the most common form of social threat action is phishing. And phishing, spelled with a PH, is basically sending fraudulent emails to people that attempt to trick them into opening an attachment or clicking on a link. And phishing is, as we've seen, the most common threat vector for installing malware on your computer. And just as a, a little bit of a historical note, um, some people wonder why phishing is sometimes spelled with a, with a PH. It's kind of a throwback to an older hacking term called that was uh, called freaking. And freaking was an old method for getting free long distance telephone calls. And so back pre-internet, when computer <clears throat> when computer um, enthusiasts exchanged information or programs, uh, using bulletin board systems where you would basically have a dial-up modem and you would call someone else's um, computer and then download um, a program over the telephone line, you would typically be do making long-distance phone calls to do this. And th this was also a period of time where long-distance was really, really expensive. And so freaking was basically a way to get your modem to generate a series of, of tones into the telephone system that would trick the telephone system into giving you a free long distance phone call. And so the PH is from phone and freaking it is a, is a play on the word frequency. And so phishing is obviously um, a big problem and the way to, um, the number one way to deal with, um, with phishing attacks is through user education. And interestingly, uh, the 2019 DBIR notes that phishing attacks are becoming a lot more successful when people access email on mobile devices versus on their computers. So one of the great, one of the, you know, the main ways or the, uh, of spotting a, a phishing attack is by looking at the uh, email address that sent it to you. If it's a domain name that you don't recognize, then it's probably a, a phishing attack or to look at, you know, the link that they want you to click on. For example, again, if you spot a domain name that is not obviously your bank's domain name on the link that they're giving you, then that's another sign that it's a fraudulent email. But it's a little harder to see this kind of stuff when you're accessing email on your mobile devices, just due to the more limited amount of uh, information that a mobile device can display. And also, People are more commonly distracted or doing multiple things when accessing things or when doing things on a mobile device. Um, even though this is a monumentally bad idea, some people use their mobile devices while they're driving even. And so you're barely able to keep your car on the road. So obviously you're not sort of scrutinizing the domain names on, on your email that you're, you're necessarily clicking on. So that's an interesting side note that may become more of, a, of an issue as um, time progresses. Another very important variety of threat action is misuse, which is the inappropriate or malicious use of privileged access or misuse of privileged access to information. So uh, particularly within a, a corporate environment, people are given access to all kinds of privileged information through their um, positions within the organization. And if we look at the different varieties of misuse, Indeed, the most common is the intentional abuse of privileges. Somebody 
stealing information perhaps for financial gain or um, for malicious reasons. However, very closely following privilege misuse is just plain old mishandling of data. You know, people forgetting their laptops on the bus or, you know, um, emailing something by, you know, emailing information that they, they shouldn't necessarily be, be emailing. And so it's not always just the disgruntled, you know, person stealing information to, um, to uh, you know, for their own benefit. That being said, when we do look at the, you know, most common motivation, financial gain is the most common uh, motivation for misuse events, followed second by espionage. And espionage can be, you know, the, the classic cloak and dagger kind of spy type espionage uh, for, you know, state sponsored organizations. It can be industrial espionage. It could even be an employee who is going to work for a competitor and wants to take some information to give them some kind of an advantage in their, their next position outside of the organization. And so just to conclude the threat action discussion, there's a few other um, types of threat action. So error, right, due to, um, and these are events due to unintentional action by the actor, uh, misdelivery of information, publishing errors, not configuring a server correctly, all that kind of stuff falls into the error category. And there's also a physical category of threat action, which is you know compromising information through physical access to um, an asset. So installing a credit card skimmer on a gas station pump would be included in this physical category you know, theft via, you know, uh, uh, a cash machine or an ATM or, you know, accessing some, something through the till of a, uh, a business would all be considered or would all be included in the, in the physical category. Now, the next um, aspect of cybersecurity I want to highlight is the real disparity we have between how quickly malicious actors are able to compromise computer systems and how quickly we're able to spot these breaches and correct them. And so this is a timeline plot that shows the timeline for the length of time it takes for um, you know, a malicious actor to compromise a system, which means gain access to it. The length of time for exfiltration, which is basically how long it takes to steal information once the system has been compromised. The length of time it takes for the organization to discover that their system is compromised. And then the length of time it takes for them to basically plug the leak to patch the server or to um, somehow deny access to the malicious actor. And so if you look at the X axis, it's kind of a, a log scale, right? So we have seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and years. And so it's important to highlight that the x-axis because it shows just how um, big a difference there is between how quickly the malicious actors can act and how quickly organizations are able to counter those actions. And so a typical compromise, you know, the majority of them are accomplished in minutes. How long does it take to steal the data? Basically from here to about here. So anywhere from from minutes to hours to days. So we compromise the security in, of the system in minutes, and then it takes us maybe hours to get the data. How long does it take us, you know, system administrators and network administrators to discover the breach? 
days, weeks, and months. How long does it take once we have discovered that our system has been compromised? How long does it take us to fix it? Again, days, weeks, months. And so it really highlights one of the main areas of cybersecurity that we need to improve on. And that is just how quickly we're able to detect and react to uh, compromises in the security of our information. One of the interesting additions to the most recent DBIR was the tracking of the sequence of events that make up the compromise of a security system. So it's typically not just one step, it's several steps. So for example, step one might be um, infecting a computer with malware. Step two might be um, using that malware as a backdoor program to hack the computer in some way. And then step three might be, you know, maybe downloading the, uh, downloading the information off of the computer. And so the um, VTRAC people were able to sort of deconstruct the uh, security events that they've, they've compiled into how many steps it took for each compromise. And as we can see from this histogram, when we look at breaches, the vast majority of the breaches were accomplished in five steps or fewer. And we can look at the, um, the most common sort of actions taken for the steps that occur early in the breach, steps that occur in the middle of the breach, and then the steps that occur closer to the end of the breach. And so early on, when we're just initially um, compromising a computer system, this tends to be done either by hacking, maybe we're logging on to a machine using stolen credentials, or error, or um, so error, so maybe a, um, a sysadmin has left a port open on a server, or maybe there's some known security vulnerability that hasn't been patched, or a social breach, maybe someone has clicked on an email attachment that they're not uh, supposed to, or misuse, which you know somebody intentionally misuses their privileges to access a system, or physical access, or malware. And it's interesting to note that malware is way down at the bottom. So malware tends to not be the first thing that is busted out in order to, to initially compromise a, um, a computer system. And it's also interesting to note just how balanced all of these actions are. So there's not a really a, a dominant action to, uh, for that initial first step in compromising a computer system. This changes though a little bit when we get to kind of the midpoint of compromising the security system. This is where we see malware really sort of bubbling up to the top, right? And so what this suggests is that, you know, maybe we gain access to a computer system by hacking it with stolen credentials. Maybe somebody clicks on an email they're not supposed to. Maybe there's a port open that shouldn't be. But then the next thing we do once we gain access to that computer typically is to install some form of malware on the computer. So you gain access to it and then you install some kind of backdoor program or a keylogger program or something like that. Um, so typically, you know, you need that malware on the computer in order to, you know, go further with your, um, you know, compromising the system. And then by the time we reach the end, Perhaps the last step is hacking. So we install a backdoor program on the computer or a key logger, and then we you know, re-access that computer with some sort of you know, intentional real-time action to sort of download or take the data off of the computer. Um, or maybe the malware just sort of blindly uploads stuff to some server somewhere. 
And um, those are probably the most, the, you know, those are the most two common steps. And so it's really, again, kind of interesting that um, the VTrack people have sort of given us this level of, of resolution because it really paints, I think, a, a, a nice picture or a detailed picture of how, you know, um, computer systems are compromised because it's not just one thing. It was, it, it's not just the hack or just the malware. This is all sort of chained together in a sequence of events necessary to, to compromise an, an asset. So just to expand on a few of those points a little bit more, this slide is all about keeping up to date. So making sure that you patch any security vulnerabilities that show up in the network devices in your system or your servers. And this is a very interesting plot that is from the 2017 DBIR, and it's broken down by industry type. So we have the information industry, the manufacturing industry, healthcare, um, accommodation and retail, public sector, the financial um, sector, and education, which is like university and um, primary school or secondary school. And what this plot shows is basically the percent of known security vulnerabilities that are fixed versus the number of weeks taken to fix them. And this is zero, and this is week 12. And there's a couple of interesting metrics that show up in the DBIR. There is AUC, which stands for Area Under Curve. And the area under the curve is basically the area under, as the name suggests, the area under this curve. So ideally, um, it would take us zero weeks to fix 100% of the findings. And so the perfect curve would look like this. At week zero, we would rock it up to 100%, and then we would stay at 100% for the remaining 12 weeks. And this red line that I've just drawn would have an area under the curve of 100%. The information sector has an area under curve of 80%. And that basically means that, you know, if we, if we look at the information curve, that means that this area under its curve is basically 80% of the total possible area. So it's, it's essentially a, a measure of how quickly we fix as many of the um, security breaches as possible. COT is basically with the final point that we reach with each of these curves. And so at the end of week 12, information has a COT of 97.5%. So that means the information uh, sector, industrial sector, um, after 12 weeks has patched 97.5% of the known security vulnerabilities. However, so I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Ideally, you know, we can see that after three weeks, we're at 75%. And then after six weeks, you know, we get closer to 100%. Ideally, we would be faster. We saw on that timeline plot that, you know, again, we're taking, we, you know, weeks and months to address compromises that are taking minutes and hours to, um, to create. But I, I think the more kind of disturbing aspect of this plot is the COT values for the other industries. So for example, the accommodation industry and the retail industry have COT values in the 60-ish percent range. So that means after 12 weeks, they have only fixed or patched 66% of the known security vulnerabilities that are out there, or basically two thirds. Even worse, if we look at education, which is the worst performing sector, after 12 weeks, they've only patched 18% of the known security vulnerabilities. And um, 
so obviously this is you know painting a picture of a lot of computer systems out there that are simply not getting patched and updated and so this makes the, you know this is just an open shot on goal for the uh for the you know the malicious actors out there because they can use very very old very well known security vulnerabilities to compromise systems and so i mean i think that this is kind of a shocking result and you know if you're watching this video or looking at this plot for the first time you might say well this is unacceptable but i mean before you say that ask yourself when was the last time you updated the firmware on the wi-fi access point in your house and um, i think maybe a lot of us you know even though this seems shocking um, we don't necessarily do it even for our own um, computer systems and so if there's any lesson here in your professional capacity, make sure you're on top of this stuff, but in your personal capacity as well. So another way that we can help keep our computer systems safe is by blocking unauthorized connections to them. So uh, a lot of malware, um, computer worms will replicate by spreading themselves from one network computer to the next. And one way to block this from happening is simply from blocking all sort of unauthorized, illegitimate connections to your computer. And of course, the devices that we use for this are firewalls. And firewalls come in two forms. One is an, a hardware firewall, which is a, a dedicated box that maybe you plug into the um, the internet modem that you receive from your internet service provider. That modem will also probably also have firewall capabilities built within it. Um, there's such a thing as software firewalls, which are firewalls built into the operating system of your computer to protect your computer. And so I think firewall is a, is a word that, you know, most people, if they work with computers at all, um, are, are pretty familiar with. And the most common type of firewall technology today is something called a stateful firewall. And stateful firewall, stateful, stateful firewalls actually use TCP header information to create temporary holes in the firewall for connections that um, are user initiated and then we'll close those holes afterwards so they're not exploited by um, you know malicious actors and basically the way it works is um, you know if you've got the internet out here and you're protected by your firewall and then this is me the firewall es essentially will um, open temporary holes in, uh, will open temporary holes for, for traffic based on outgoing connections. So connections that are initiated by the user. So if I want to connect to a certain website, I will initiate a, an outgoing connection to that website. And then the firewall will open a temporary hole to allow traffic from that website to flow back to my computer. However, when I terminate that connection to that web server, let's say the hole in the firewall is closed. And let's consider an example where, um, let's say my computer is IP address 1.1.1.1 and I'm accessing a, a server. Oops. That has IP address 2.2.2.2. And so and and let's say for the purposes of this example it's a HTTP server, a web server, so we're connecting to port 80. And so the firewall registers that my IP address has created a socket on a particular port on my computer and wants to connect to port 80 on um, the server computer. And it will actually look inside the TCP header and see that I've created a SYN packet and I'm sending a SYN packet to the server to initiate a connection. Receiving that SYN packet is the firewall's 
um, trigger to open a temporary hole for network traffic. So it creates a temporary entry in the firewall table that allows incoming traffic from the server port 80 that will be sent to my computer on port 7004. The temporary hole allows only traffic from the server's IP address and port number 80 back through the firewall. It doesn't allow any other IP address and it won't even allow traffic from any other port on computer 2.2.2.2. This temporary hole will remain in effect until fin packets are exchanged and the firewall will again look into the TCP header, note that we're exchanging fin packets now, and it will seal up that hole. So the hole exists only for the duration of time that um, I'm exchanging information with the server. This leads into sort of a broader discussion now about um, what's known as packet inspection or network traffic analysis. So really a stateful firewall is not just sort of treating a packet like a, you know, sort of a, a group of bits. It's actually looking inside the packet, um, in this case to the TCP header, in order to understand how to um, handle that packet. This is known as um, shallow packet inspection. So looking as far as the TCP header is known as shallow packet inspection. Deep packet inspection is looking into the actual payload of the packet in order to determine if the packet carries legitimate traffic or not. And deep packet inspection can, for example, look for things like malware. So if a malware executable has a certain you know, signature in it, then we can actually look for that signature, spot a packet that is carrying um, a piece of malware into our network and drop that packet before it even has a chance to reach one of our computers. And so you can see, this is also sometimes known as an intrusion detection system or network traffic analysis. There's a few um, terms for it, but it basically refers to looking inside all of the packets to see if there's something bad. And it's a challenging technical problem, first of all, because we want packets to be traveling over our network at tens of gigabits per second in many cases. And so we've got to have hardware that's fast enough to look inside each one of those packets, think about what it's looking at, and then make a decision on whether or not the packet is good or not good. And that's really hard to do without slowing down the throughput of the network. The other potential problem with deep packet inspection is the ethical problem of internet censorship. And this is, you know, deep packet inspection opens the possibility of, you know, state sponsored entities from deciding what content they necessarily want to allow in their country or not allow in their country. And this is very much related to the broader um, discussion around net neutrality. And net neutrality is all about treating every packet the same and um, allowing packets to just travel over the internet regardless of who's generated them and um, what they contain. But, um, you know, we can see now that there there is like with most um, ethical technology questions related to the internet, both pros and cons to all of uh, to to many of these different technologies. So the sinful knock exploit is one example of how packet inspection can be used to spot malware communication. And sinful knock is basically. Um, malware programs changing different fields within the TCP header in order to, um, you know, send information between, send sort of concealed information between malware programs. So I mentioned back in the TCP module that there are a series of unused fields in the TCP header, things like the urgent pointer, things like the reserved um, bits in the, in the TCP header. And these can unfortunately be manipulated by um, malware programs 
in order to communicate. So um, in the case of sinful knock, malwares, um, so the malware will, will acknowledge a sin packet as usual, but then to identify um, itself to the other malware program, it will do a couple of things. First of all, it sets the differential between the acknowledgement number and the sin sequence number to a particular value. This is completely allowed. Uh, both the client and server are allowed to choose their own initial sequence numbers. Commonly, they both choose zero, but it's possible for the server to choose anything. And the malware programs chose a particular offset in order to give the other program a hint that this was malware traffic coming in and not just regular um, TCP traffic. The other thing that the malware did was hard code um, the TCP options field to a certain series of, of numbers. And the urgent pointer was set to a value of one, but the urgent flag was not set. And so a TCP header with this, um, with these settings, basically would be recognized by any other malware program um, that uses the sinful knock exploit as carrying malware traffic. And when um, the controlling computer, the C2 server that is controlling computers using the sinful knock exploit wants to send control information to the computers, it would set the push and the axed or the push and ack flags. The string text is written in the payload with a, a certain offset from the header. And there is a command string that has been ex exclusive ORed with a static key that is also contained at a certain offset. So again, manipulation of the TCP header to let the malware program know that this isn't normal TCP traffic. It's a command from the controlling server that's about to tell the infected computer what to do. And once the, um, the C2 server has alerted the, piece, the, the malware that it's going to be sending it a command, then the actual command that is sent is uh, via disguised HTML traffic where the commands for the malware are embedded in the comments fields of the HTML traffic. And so, I mean, this is a lot of detail, but stepping back, basically the way that malware sends a message to the server is by, you know, creating these settings in its SYN packet. So this is the way that an infected computer lets the server know that it's been infected. And then when the server is gonna tell the malware to do something on the infected computer, it uses these settings to alert the malware that more commands are coming and then those commands are sent using disguised HTML traffic. And so it's, um, this is an example of exploiting the TCP header to send mal malware traffic, but it is also an example of where shallow packet inspection could be used to spot malware traffic. So once this exploit was um, discovered, then basically network routers were able to use um, packet inspection to look for these characteristics in a TCP header. And when they spot them, they basically drop the packet and prevent the malware from communicating with its server. And finally, just a brief introductory word about encryption. Encryption is the use of special scrambling techniques to prevent unauthorized actors from reading information. So you, you, you shuffle, you mask the information that you send so that it looks um, just like you know, garbled ones and zeros for anybody who's trying to read it without permission. And encryption is becoming very, very common. And in fact, most internet traffic today is encrypted. This plot, and it's hard to see the, uh, the axes. You can access this. This is from the Google Transparency Report, and I've included the link here. So you can access the, the full plot and many others like it. But it basically just shows the percentage of HTTPS or encrypted web traffic that's recorded by the recorded for people using the Chrome, uh, the Google Chrome web browser. And 
This is by operating system, so Windows, Android, actual Chrome computers, Linux computers, and Macs. Um, the y-axis, it's hard to see, but this goes from 0% to 100% of traffic. And on the x-axis, we've got January 2017, um, and this is all the way up to 20, whoops, 2020. And so we can see, you know, some platforms starting down here below 40%, other platforms back in 2017, sort of in the 70 to 80% range. But we see a lot, we see convergence in all of these lines. And by 2020, we're basically up around the 80 to 90% range. And so this doesn't represent all traffic on the internet, but it is sort of a, a representative sample. And it shows that encryption now is being used for the, the majority of web traffic. Netflix relatively recently moved from unencrypted to encrypted traffic as well. And um, YouTube is the same. So this is good from a, a privacy perspective, but it also does prevent or it makes it more difficult for things like deep packet inspection technologies to look into the payload to spot um, malware. So encryption, while it keeps our information safe, it also helps malware uh, from being discovered from, you know, through network traffic analysis.